We're going to dig into the electricity sector now, and we're going to have um, Commissioner Potter give us a brief um, status update on selected dockets, and this will be followed by a discussion that looks um, at the roadblocks in four different buckets. So we're going to look at regulatory and policy challenges, we're going to look at um, equity and community challenges, technical and cost. Um, for the panelists, we have, um, we have well, so for the moderator, we have Matthias Fripp from the Age Department of um, Electrical Engineering. We have David Bissell from Kauai Island Utility Cooperative. We have Scott Sue from Pine Electric, Brian Kailoha from Hoi Energy, and John Poe from Hoi Natural Energy. These are the, the highest profile dockets that we have at the commission um, and getting the most national attention, I believe, um, except for new distributed energy resources. So I'm going to talk a little about our integrated uh, grid planning, which is with the HECO companies and their initiative that's underway. I'll talk about the performance-based regulation docket. Uh, microgrid docket and the distributed energy resources DR grid services docket demand response. Uh, so I'm going to kick off with my favorite docket. This is the performance based regulation docket. In April of 2018, the commission opened this proceeding. Uh, subsequently, the, uh, the legislature and the governor signed into law the uh, Act 5, which focused on uh, the Ratepayer Protection Act. Uh, that is, a st and the, the, the act and the proceeding focused on, are, is focused on breaking the link between capital investments and utility revenues. So uh, what it's trying to do is create the utility of the future, a utility that's going to focus on customer service, resiliency, grid investment, decentralized uh, renewable resources, and, and really try and transform the way that they do business in order to help their integrity uh, financially as well as serve the residents of Hawaii. Um, so the, the proceeding began, we opened it with, um, by bifurcating the proceeding. The first phase of the proceeding focused on the existing regulatory structure that's in place and tried to identify various aspects of that regulatory structure that needed to be addressed, modified, or improved in order to help transform that utility business model. And the second phase, which is currently underway, uh, we are focused on the actual mechanisms that are going to be utilized in, in, the, uh, in the, the final decision in order. And basically those, are, those are include the revenue adjustment mechanism as well as the performance incentive mechanism. The, the commission issued an order in the second quarter of 2019, which closed the first phase of the proceeding, and we began deliberations with the working groups in quarter two and quarter three of 2019. Um, the working groups are a group of stakeholders. There's, there's a, a great representation of Hawaii um, entities that are participating in that process and providing feedback. It's, it's been an extraordinary uh, opportunity and, and, and uh, very interesting to watch the work and the collaboration within those stakeholder meetings. Um, so that the, we anticipate that the, uh, the, the working groups will submit a, uh, the, the proposals for phase two in May of 2020. We'll hold evidentiary hearings in October of 2020, and then we'll actually issue a decision and order in December of 2020. And this is really the most transformational, I believe, in the energy landscape docket that we have in the energy landscape right now, because it really is focused on identifying, changing the regulatory structure to reward the, com the utilities for how they perform, rather than just for the capital investments. And so it's it's going to be a pretty big overhaul of how we regulate the utility and our relationship with the utility and the utility's relationship with the customer. So the next is our distributed energy resources and DR docket. This is all our demand response grid services. Uh, this is a recently opened docket and it is we currently have interveners in place and we, we're setting up a procedural schedule so we're actually just beginning this initiative. We, we opened a new docket and closed the 2014 DER docket because we felt that it was imperative for the Commission to evaluate grid services and distributed energy resources in one proceeding because the, we can evaluate time varying pricing, different programs and services for both DR and for um, distributed energy resources and also to, to look at different types of services that we can provide to customers, utilizing the different infrastructure that's going into place right now. So this proceeding will continue likely for many years. Uh, it's not going to be a one-size-fits-all, we, we open and close it. It's going to be a, mo numerous iterations as we design programs and different rates and tariffs that best serve our customers here in Hawaii. 
Uh, next is the integrated grid planning proceeding. Uh, this began in 2018, and the initiative was, and the proceeding was opened to respond to the company's need to integrate the integrated resource plan, not, not the grid planning, but the resource plan, which is at the bulk power system and the distribution system planning. And the reason that was imperative was the, the distribution system has seen such high penetrations of photovoltaics, of distributed photovoltaics, it's, it, it is a disservice to not incorporate that into the planning process. And this planning process has actually gained a lot of public attention and national attention as well. We're one of the first utility, or the, our utility is one of the first in the country that's undertaking this, this type of initiative. And it's very comprehensive, and it's, it, it is something that's actually taking several years. Um, it, it began in 2018, as I mentioned, and the, the company submitted a work plan in that year, and the commission approved it in 2019. Work began with the, the stakeholder deliberation, the, um, which is the working groups on the effort, and that's currently underway. However, the companies did submit a, a released uh, soft launch RFP that's attempting to gain some of the, in, incorporate some of the knowledge about what's available as resources out in the industry that they can bring into distribution in the integrated grid planning. Um, that also includes uh, non-wires alternatives, so that's very exciting for us because we want to see the different types of resources that can serve this without just being infrastructure that the utility is, is investing in. Uh, we anticipate that the working group will continue meeting through 2020, about quarter two, and then the, co the companies will begin their analytical process uh, for at least six months. We anticipate a, a plan provided to the commission in about mid-2021, um, and then we'll have to reiterate that process. This also is not you know, a one and done kind of initiative. They'll, will accept or deny that initial proposal uh, or plan, and then they'll, once it's approved, they'll continue doing iterations so that we can really build a resilient grid that's interconnected and thinking holistically about how we deliver energy, um, both at a decentralized plan or either at a, a bulk power system plan. So utility scale, distributed scale, it's, it's all gonna be included and in, in, in thought about within this, this plan. And uh, third, we have the microgrid tariff. Uh, we're the first uh, state in the country, and almost the world, but in the country that's actually developing a microgrid service tariff. Uh, this initiative has taken place over the last year. Um, we have working groups that are working on the details right now. We anticipate the, um, the, 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 the working groups will submit a draft tariff proposal uh, in February of 2020, um, and then a final in, in the following month in March, and then the, we expect a, a decision by the commission in, in the, around June or uh, July, which would accept that proposal. One of the things that's interesting about this is we really tried to tease out the types of microgrids that, we, that are necessary in the state of Hawaii. We focused on resiliency and outage response first and foremost. Um, and that being the greatest need and also under the direction of the, the legislature and the governor and Act 200. Um, this, this is really intended to address some of these long transmission lines that lead across the island um, away from the centralized load generation. Um, so we need, we need different mechanisms in order to produce load in a decentralized way so that we're able to have a more resilient communities out there that, that are able to produce their own energy and perhaps service their neighbors within a, a connected microgrid. So, and this is, I'm leaving you with our spaghetti chart of the, of the regulatory landscape here in Hawaii. There's actually a couple of things missing from this, but there's a ton of things that we're working on in order to advance energy here in Hawaii and try and transform the way that we think about how energy should be produced, how we compensate the utility, how we serve our customers, we build resiliency, we think about the renewable portfolio standards, um, and there's a whole host of items up there that, that really are contributing to that kind of an effort. So. Look forward to talking with any of you after this if you're interested, but thank you very much. So we're gonna kind of rotate through the topics, the sort of subtopics that we had here, and I think each of you have well, responses to that, and then we'll try to have a, a quick discussion about it. We don't have super long. So um, I guess beginning with the, the roadblocks in the regulatory and policy area, uh, would any of you like to say something about that? No. <laughs> <laughs> I know. 
like, we have two regulated utilities here at the commissioners, so I'm sure they're really excited about talking about that. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll, I'll start. <laughs> I, I, I almost feel obligated to say something. Uh, but you know, as, as uh, Commissioner Potter just laid out for you, right, there's a tremendous amount of activity that's happening on the regulatory uh, side of the, of the house to modernize our regulatory system. We at Hawaiian Electric, along with Dave on, on Kauai, you know, we are you know, full bore trying to move forward to modernize the electric system from the actual infrastructure perspective. Um, and to go along with that, we have to modernize our regulatory system, which also, by the way, includes how we, as a company, do business. So we're also modernizing our own business practices because that goes hand in glove with this uh, you know, performance-based uh, regulation docket. So I think that we, uh, the, the ship has already been launched. And as we look forward in 2020 and beyond, uh, it's going to be absolutely critical that we are paying attention to all of the uh, very important objectives we're trying to achieve. And Commissioner Potter, you just nailed everything down there, right? It's at the end of the day, you know, for me as the electric company guy, uh, it's about what do we need to make sure that we can maintain reliable and affordable and clean energy service so that all of the businesses, all of our customers can continue to live their lives and also to thrive in their in their lives. Uh, if we don't hit all of those, then we are ultimately failing in what our obligations are. And uh, I think that's a collective uh, obligation on all of our parts. So it's it's a big task, but it's absolutely imperative that we, we modernize all of these things in parallel. Otherwise, it's just not going to work. I'll, I'll add a little bit to that as a, as a former commissioner. Um, I'm, I'm more on the technical side now, but I agree with Scott that a lot of the things that when I was a commissioner I, I wished would happen are in the process of happening now. And that includes things like the performance-based rate-making rate um, docket to go ahead and align the utilities incentives and, and profit motives with our energy goals better than they are right now and you know under the old model. And secondly, I think the, the pricing aspects, I mean, we've kind of, I think, been really behind on that, but the commission is addressing that now with the DER and, and market track type issues. So I, I think those two things, like Scott said, are, are on their way to being developed and will help, help us solve a lot of the issues that we're going to be faced with. I'm going to add from a little bit different perspective as, as um, Carl had shared and showed on his graph just what we need to get to uh, for the 100% goal and, and the energy efficiency component of it. There was two parts, right? There was the, energy, the programs and the Koi Energy is running and then there's that other piece that other celebrity mentioned, uh, energy codes, appliance standards. So when we look at it from a policy perspective, um, there's only so much that incentives and, and programs are going to be able to do to get us to where we need to go and, and even um, listening to what's happening in North Carolina, they have a more aggressive energy efficiency goal than we even have here in the state of Hawaii. So as we look forward, I think we have to be really careful when we talk about uh, the standards and the policies that we set forward, that we are doing things that are progressive and pushing the envelope forward to what we need to do to hit our goals because we can't do it just through programs and incentives. And I think a lot of the uh, conversation that's happening now in opposition for things that are pushing for energy efficiency talk about customer choice and there's a lot of things where we don't give customer choices on whether it be seat belts uh, you know, there's, there's talk about baking so one of these things you know as we look at what the real customer choice is especially in new development are the are the homeowners really making that choice or are the developers making that choice worried about first cost rather than long-term cost so you know that's one of the things we have to if we're going to be serious about it we have to develop the policies to to really uh, support that I guess I mean. <laughs> From our side on Kauai, we've actually been very pleased with the transition in the commission. Uh, years ago, we were always complaining about speed and certainty on dockets, and particularly on renewable energy project approvals. We're always working. Almost every project done in this state is being done with a partner. A lot of them are mainland high-tech companies doing innovative things and one of their concerns is they don't want to come mess around and spend time and resources and not get approval or have the approval drive 
drag out over a long period. We've seen real progress in that. Approvals are coming fairly quickly. I don't think there's much fear of good projects being turned down or unnecessarily delayed, so we've been quite pleased with that change. I think that's part of the modernization and, and folk refocus the commission. Yeah, actually, I'm, I, I feel like everyone's being really nice <laughs> because I'm sitting here. Um, so we recognize at the commission that our regulatory structure right now and the way that we actually we conduct ourselves and that we're, we're, the way that we regulate the utilities is antiquated. Um, and so there, there's certainly ways in that, for example, the last round of PPAs that came in from the phase two with the Hawaiian electric companies. They submitted eight uh, renewable projects to us um, on December 31st <laughs> of 2018. And we internally, we said, you know what, we're not gonna be the bottleneck at all in this. So everybody just buckle down, let's get this done by the time the Hawaii Energy Conference comes, and I think that was March 24th. So we cleared six PPAs in three months, where it normally took one, for one PPA, it took six months at a minimum. And so with the idea of, re if we wanna move in this re renewable energy space, the commission has to be responsible for fast tracking this stuff. Because we put those pressures on the utilities to get there, we have to be equally as motivated and, and to get this stuff done. Um, and I think that, that that's really a, a, a shift in the way that things have happened. And we've had to actually retool our processes for evaluating how we look at these types of projects in order to uh, to move that quickly, you know, before we go through very lengthy processes in order and information requests in order to determine whether the project was right, justified, you know, in the public interest. And we still conduct very thorough analysis, but because we've now moved into a competitive bidding process, and that's, that's how we've asked the utilities to conduct these types of procurements for renewables, then that's, that's exactly, we don't necessarily need to do those types of of, of deep digging in order to, to evaluate whether the, the project projects are prudent and in the public interest, whether they're reasonably priced, because the market has already determined that they are. And so that that's a way that we're still partnering with each of the utilities to determine what, what makes sense, how can we move Hawaii that more quickly? And, and performance-based regulation is the same thing. How can we as regulators allow the utility to move into the utility of the future. They need to be nimble. They need to have freedom to be innovative. They need to be able to, to reflect on their business practices and ensure that they're, getting, that, you, that they're meeting the goals through methods that are the best for them. And we need to stand back and allow, give them some flexibility to do that. And so that's a different way of micro, it's not micromanaging anymore. We're actually trying to say, okay, here's the game, here's the rules to the game. And basically, let's see how you do when you perform. And then we can compensate you on, the, uh, on those type of, of that performance rather than it just being, um, it, it being something like, oh, we're giving you a rate of return and, and make investments and you, you basically are able to obtain profit. So really important for the utility to, or for the, the, the commission to make changes structurally and, and the way that we do things in order to help get us to 100% uh, renewable, focus on climate change, looking at greenhouse gas reduction, et cetera. Can, sorry, my, my text, can I just, <laughs> sure. if I could just add, you know, something that, that you just said, um, Jenny, is, is so critical, which is, you know, okay, we are the regulated party, and of course, as a regulated person, you always hope for more freedom and more flexibility. You know, tell us what the expectations are, but then step back and allow us to figure out how do we best meet those expectations. And uh, you're absolutely right. I think in the past, you know, there have been times where, you know, it's almost as if regulation has gone in, you know, ebbs and flows. Sometimes there has been more flexibility, but then at some point, there is a sense that, well, you know what, we have to get more into the details of how are these guys running the business, are they truly doing what they should be doing, mm -hmm. and then we start increasing the level of oversight and it can get into almost like a micromanagement situation. Mm -hmm. um, so then, hopefully, I think what we, where we are today is we are now on the upswing where we all recognize that, you know what, that is extremely inefficient. Um, you end up having spending so much of your time just going through process and process and process versus being able to execute. And I think that's so, something that uh, I'm, I'm very excited and really looking forward to, which is as we move forward to the PBR framework and then also all of the other things that we're working on, 
uh, that we will be able to focus on execution and meeting the expectations. I mean, we still have to be held accountable, obviously, but having that flexibility is going to be so critical to being able to be successful, not only ourselves, but our developers our, and our customers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going to try to move it along. We've got three more topics in 15 minutes, so, um, and I'm accumulating questions, but I think I'm going to save them till the end so we can get some coverage here. So um, I guess the next topic up is equity and community. Um, and, you know, to some extent, some way I see that is there can be sort of a tension between, well, one example is we want to bring customers in providing services back to the grid, um, but that can create tension if, you know, one customer's profit is another customer's cost, um, and that can create difficulty sometimes in moving ahead. Um, are there issues like that that we need to worry about? Are there obstacles uh, and challenges that we need to overcome? Um, and, you know, feel free to move quickly, too, if, if there's not much to say. Um, yeah, ab absolutely, particularly on uh, distributed generation. I, I think we're moving, again, positively on that, where there's more of a recognition that just because it's not utility, from the utility, it's not necessarily great for everybody. And that I think the rate making is starting to catch up, the analysis is catching up of trying to really properly value it, properly cost things, so that we're not, we don't have that inequality between a lot of times the wealthy and the, the, the less wealthy taking advantage of systems. So I think we're moving positive in that direction, really at the, maybe not the total lead of the United States, but pretty close. From, from the Hawaii energy perspective, I think, you know, as we try to work with Hawaii's families, particularly impacted by the heavy energy burdens that we all face, whether it's electricity, gas, um, you, you name it, you know, there's certain things that are within their control and others that are not. And from an efficiency standpoint, a lot of times uh, those that are the least, are most impacted or have the highest energy burden, they're renters. So their ability to, again, make choices and decisions around the equipment that they're using is, is very limited. So, that, so that's a real challenge. And, and I think for me personally, and, and you know, I'm excited Scott's here as well. I mean, when we look at who are a lot of the disadvantaged communities, it's, it's the Native Hawaiians. And, as, as we look to move forward and push towards our 100% clean energy goals, um, we have to also address there have been some inequities in the past, whether it's some of the distributed generation that's happened or, or, or others. And by getting to a more equitable place means there may be a little more inequity to, to get there and not everything is going to be fair. Um, the other thing I wanted to add from an energy use perspective that we find very interesting but also concerning is that if we're going to be able to hit our clean energy goals, and, and based on the projections that uh, were shown earlier that was the, the basis of the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative, um, a lot of that didn't factor into increased e uh, utilization of EV at the time, also didn't factor in just what's happening with the climate and how many more people are installing air conditioning. So we're seeing now another inequity that's, that's coming, the have and have nots, who has air conditioning and who doesn't. And, uh, and what happens there. And the, the last part I would say is some of the early adopters to PV, and I, I'm one of them. I was a NEM PV uh, adopter. I put in AC, and I probably use more today as the head of Hawaii Energy, who's supposed to be using less, than I did six years ago. And it's, it's a real challenge. So if, even if I'm having that struggle with my family, I know that there's a lot of people who have put in PV for the right reasons, but in a lot of areas, we're going in the wrong direction. So our, our pricing, and our tariffs have to really, you know, evolve to a place where we're bringing some of that equity back. So I'll, I'll, I'll comment on this question from a slightly different uh, uh, area, which is the current issues that we're starting to see more and more of in terms of community um, concerns about renewable energy development projects in their in their neighborhoods. Uh, you know, I think that, uh, you know, let's use wind, the wind farm, the Puamakani as an example. You know, we all, as those in the industry, we know that you can only site wind farms where you have the wind resource. Um, and even then, it's, it can't just be sort of windy. It's got to meet a certain standard of uh, consistency and, and wind strength, right, in order to make it a feasible wind project. So that re really drives those types of projects in a certain location. Uh, but more and more, we're starting to see that it doesn't really matter if it's a wind farm or a solar farm or uh, like on Dave's Island, uh, hydro. 
we are starting to see where renewable energy projects are being lumped into just the overall issues of an infrastructure project. And, you know, folks have very real concerns about proximity to their houses, uh, visible, visible impacts, and so on. And I think that as we go forward from a policy perspective, we are really going to have to think more creatively about how do you address these issues and perhaps the old way of, okay, putting it on a developer to say, all right, you have to engage with the community, you have to figure out if, is there a community benefits package you can offer. I mean, yes, that is still a potential tool, but I think we have to do better from a policy perspective. And actually, it may even trace back to how do we go forward in deciding what are the resources that are needed, uh, who gets to participate in that discussion, and having that type of engagement actually feed into the RFP process. You know, right now, we issue RFPs, and it's all sources, all technology types, and it's pretty much left to developers to go find the locations to put these projects in. And then that's when typically the communities are, are engaged with. Um, I think we're going to have to rethink that and how do we upfront the engagement and um, participation. Amen. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm going to lump together the last two here because they're kind of related. Every technical problem has a solution if you have enough money. So um, are there are there um, sort of technical or cost obstacles um, that you're seeing in, in trying to move ahead towards the, these deep decarbonization goals we're talking about? Yeah, I'll take the, the first shot at this, but, but first I want to say I, I agree with Scott. I think the biggest challenge to getting where we need to go is going to be siting and, and community acceptance or lack thereof. And, and, we really need to find new ways to approach it up front and, and get buy-in. Because um, especially like on Oahu with the amount we need and the limited land space, I think that's going to be the biggest challenge we face. Um, on the technical side, uh, I kind of prepared this question specifically. Um, I'm not going to use a slide, but the, the general concept is that I think we need to find some solutions to the grid services that we need to assure grid reliability. Um, and there's a lot of work going on in this area, the grid services docket and things like that, but there's, there's certain services that, are, are that the grid needs and, and that have, you know, traditionally all of those services were able to be provided by thermal generation. But as we're moving more and more towards renewables, particularly the intermittent resources, uh, wind and solar, um, and those thermal units retiring, something has to step in to be able to provide those services. And a, a lot of them can be provided by other things. Um, there's definitely technical potential there for those to be provided, um, but we're, we're not quite there yet. Um, particularly things, you know, short grid, grid strength type services, inertia, and then those are the quick responding things. And then on the other side, kind of just general capacity. Um, batteries can do an awful lot of it. There's other options like, you know, DR and, and charging EVs and, and flywheels and synchronous condensers and things like that. But all of it um, needs to be uh, assessed and, and some of it still needs to be developed. Um, and I won't go into any more detail than that, but uh, there's just um, going to be some challenges in that area. So. And, and people need to understand. I mean, I hear a lot of people seem to have the impression that if we put enough PV and batteries on, our, you know, we'll get there and we don't have to worry about it. But there's definitely issues that have to be considered and overcome um, with, with filling some of the gaps that will be there with that type of mix. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, and there's a, a grid that's operating on 100% renewable multiple days. Now, last this week, we were five hours at 100% renewable. Uh, the technical challenges can be overcome, but, they <laughs> uh, but following up on John's point, solar is not the answer in total. We, we've kind of, we're, we're already looking past solar and going, we can't have our whole grid. We're not going to get close to 100% just on PV and batteries. Battery, long duration batteries are still very expensive and 
really the technology's not there. Uh, you know, to move past four or five hours. The real outside is probably eight hours you can do economically, to some degree of economically. And we get long periods of rain, uh, cloudy weather, and to start, like, and we're starting to do this on Kauai, like how do we move to 80%, 100% renewable? And we're working hard at investigating a pump storage hydro where you can get massive amounts of, sol of, of a storage, you know, 100 hours, 200 hours of storage versus four or eight. The problem is, how, how do you value that? How do, you, how do we look at it if it comes up more expensive than PV, if you can get PV for eight cents with batteries and it might cost 15 cents with uh, the same thing with, with the water storage, it can move you past, it's a different technology, but we're increasingly saying, well, we think we got to do that if we're going to be serious about reaching 100%, because the battery technology may evolve, but it's rather doubtful that you'll be able to get the vast amount of storage that we need. So I think long explanation, trying to shorten it, as we move further and further, some of these easy technologies like PV and battery, we're going to have to stretch further and get into more. They may be more expensive, they may be harder, but we're rapidly moving throughout the state to that. I think uh, Oahu's got real challenges, with, as John said, with land and how much more solar can they put down after this next round of, of uh, projects. So we're all, we're all going to start. I think some of the low-hanging fruit's been harvested, and we're getting into tougher and tougher uh, technical problems. OK. Um, so I've got a lot of questions here. We've been given a five-minute extension to be so, um, uh, I'm gonna. I'm gotta. I just have to be kind of selective with the questions. So I'm gonna start with one, which was um, kind of actually sets us up for the next panel. But um, going down the line to each of you, um, is your organization dedicating any policy resources to extending EV benefits? Um, which the, the writer said that's very key to bending the curve. So what are you doing, or are you doing anything to encourage EVs? I, I actually will probably defer to Brian to talk about the EV rebate program that the legislature so kindly um, gave us uh, several, several hundred thousand dollars to um, basically install or to, to encourage installation of, of level two EV chargers. And Brian's actually uh, facilitating that program. So Y Energy has taken over that for us and we're excited so he can talk about that. Sure, I'll touch on it real quickly, but I really, <laughs> it's a small part of really Hawaiian Electric's electrification of transportation roadmap, but obviously one of the barriers that was identified through that is just the EV charging infrastructure. So again, as Commissioner Potter said, it's exciting to see that there's some state uh, taxpayer resources that are being put towards this, uh, $400,000 in total. So that, that's great, it's, but it's probably just a drop in the bucket when you look at um, the infrastructure that's needed, not only in the cost of the actual charging systems, but um, as well as just all the in, uh, the upgrades that need to happen to install um, EV charging stations. So it's a great it's a great first start. I think part of the triennial plan that was approved by the commission uh, earlier last year, I guess in 2019 now, uh, did create a little more runway for uh, Hawaii Energy to be participating in EOT efforts as it makes sense to align with, again, ECO's uh, roadmap and, and carbon uh, reduction. So it is an expansion of the services that we are doing. So as uh, both Commissioner Potter and Brian mentioned, um, electric transportation is a huge part of where we see the future, uh, not only for transportation, getting transportation uh, decarbonized, but also to help us decarbonize our system. Um, every, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say probably everybody in this room knows that you know, the secret sauce is if you can get more good load during the daytime, the more we can take that renewable energy that's produced during the daytime. And think about it from the perspective, you know, I'm, I'm living in a de, uh, decoupled uh, system where, you know, the state has their, these very aggressive energy efficiency goals. We're trying to reduce the load, if anything. And meanwhile, at the same time, we still need to pay for the overall electric system. Um, somebody. Richard, is this your phone? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Leave it there. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure who I was being recorded by. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, so if we can build that electric charging infrastructure quick, you know, more quickly, 
uh, more aggressively. I, I know there's always going to be this issue of, well, at what point are you getting too far ahead of the market? Uh, but I absolutely do think that we have to be more aggressive. Uh, so what is the role that the state plays, the Hawaii Energy? Of course, we have our roadmap. Uh, when we talk to developers of condominiums or new construction, one of the challenges that they face is, okay, if I'm going to be mandated that I have to provide X number of stalls with EV charging, that can be hugely expensive. So where is the, is there any financial support that can be provided to them? Or another discussion that they often ask us is, with the utility, what role do you folks have to provide that make-ready infrastructure? Um, you know, PUC, consumer advocate, I see Dean standing way in the back in the room, right, where they're always going to be working with us to decide at what point does it make sense for the utility to pick up those types of infrastructure costs. If this is a hugely important state policy, then I think it may end up being where we have to have the discussion about what the role the utility can play to provide that make-ready infrastructure um, so that it can make things happen a lot more quickly. Um, I guess the question, though, was are we dedicating resources to help think about these policy issues? The absolute uh, answer for us is absolutely yes, it's very important. Um, we have to keep the momentum going with electric transportation. Yeah, we're supposed to go down. I'll, I'll do it quick. Uh, <laughs> Kauai, yes, uh, but we're, we're, we're so different than Oahu and all the other islands are a whole different outlook on electric vehicles and uh, we don't have the big condos that make it difficult for people to buy a vehicle and charge them. We haven't had an overwhelming push for charging infrastructure on Kauai. Most people are charging them at home at nighttime. Um, I'm, ben will talk about it in the next session, but we have a real good relationship with the county and some other organizations working on potential uh, rebates and ways. What we're, we're concerned with is we want to incentivize people not to charge right during our peak demand period. So from a utility side, we're more interested in giving uh, incentives to set up chargers that will stop uh, re uh, charging during you know, 8 to 10 o'clock at night during our peak than we are actually getting them to the, to the uh, people for the ability to charge. No, I just have to add because I see Mitch standing there that hydrogen vehicles are electric vehicles too. <laughs> if we can figure out how to make the hydrogen economically and it can be used for those fuel cell vehicles and maybe we can convert some gas stations and don't need a lot of extra infrastructure but that could be part of the solution. Of course. Thanks, John. <laughs> um, so, since we're at the Capitol and we have a PUC commissioner here, um, do any of you have, can each of you give sort of one thing that would be on your wish list for a new law or a new order from the commission um, that would help us move ahead in meeting our the objectives? I'm all ears. <laughs> Free money. No. We, we're really not pushing for anything. I mean, we, we like certainty and and really the more, from a co-op side, the more we're left alone, the happier we are. So <laughs> that's kind of, we just, uh, we don't, we're not pushing for anything. I, I would just reiterate a couple of things I said earlier, the alignment of the utilities incentives with the state policy goals and, you know, some really smart pricing programs for customers to, you know, help them, encourage them to do the same thing and achieve their you know, energy goals of the state through pricing and economic decisions. Yeah, I wouldn't add m much to my first answer around some of the policies that are needed, I think, on, from an energy efficiency perspective. I think probably what I neglected to say when I was sharing that is that energy efficiency already is extremely cost effective, especially when you look at the, the life cycle cost versus first cost. And I think that's where we get hung up in a lot of the conversation. So it's not as if these policies will have an economic or a, a a negative in economic impact. Actually, it's going to have a positive economic impact and thus uh, kind of advocating for the expansion of a lot of what's on the books. In particular, we got the energy code uh, finally passed at a state level two and a half years ago. We're working through the counties, the different counties are, are going through their stages, but it's a heavy lift every three years if we're going to do this. And we got to find a way to just be adopting new codes right when they come out. 
so my wish would be um, beyond just energy. Um, we have a challenge in this state, I think, where we have so many uh, good, well-intentioned state policies, but there is not really a good way that I see where people have been able to integrate them well together. So land use policy, housing development, environmental protection, cultural, energy, transportation, all of these policies are starting to really butt up against each other. And, you know, it's hard to try and execute and implement well on any one of those because you just cannot do that in, in a silo. And we need to, if anything, it may not be a single law, but there needs to be some sort of mechanism where periodi periodically you have to take a look at these policies and, and recalibrate, given what you see happening in other areas. Mm -hmm. And as a state, what are the highest priorities of the state that we need to pay attention to? I mean, we all live and breathe in the energy space, but I've... Uh, we've all been in those discussions where somebody says, you know what, you folks want to raise rates because you want to modernize the grid and so on, but I can barely afford to pay my rent. And I can't even, you know, think about having my kids get new clothes for school or whatever it is. And boy, what do I say to that, right? So I think that that has to have, uh, I mean, in this building, uh, as well as in our other areas, that's where we really need to have that, that good forced discussion to help people prioritize. All right, well, thanks a lot. Um, I've got a lot of more good questions here and more spinning in my head, but unfortunately we're out of time. So um, I'd encourage all of you to ask our, our panelists questions afterwards, if you can catch them in the hall or in the auditorium. Um, and I'd like to all, ask you to all to join me in giving them a big thank you for speaking.